Well, good morning. You know, we, we live in a very interesting time in society. We live in a day and age where people are so connected yet so distant. I had a fellow the other day give me this long appeal on, on social media why he can no longer follow me because I associate with a pastor that he had a problem with. And I'm like, who are you? I, I don't even know who this, this person was. But the problem is with the rise of social media platforms, many of you in this room and many people online, we determine our friends by how many faces we have on Facebook. We look about how many people follow us on Twitter. We look at the black and white text and we think that's our community and therefore we feel safe, we feel protected, that we have this great community and we're surrounded by great groups. But the reality is we are very, very lonely. And for the Christian, we can look around the world and go, you know what, I get this. But Christians are equally lonely. With social media and the rise of the internet, something else has happened, and that is that Christians feel content that they can have a long-distance relationship with Jesus Christ and the community of Christians. That was what happened over COVID-19. As we were telling the government officials, you cannot separate a Christian from the gathering because it's ordained under the Holy Scriptures that we gather for our spiritual health, for our betterment. We cannot be doing this alone. We don't do it through Zoom. We do it together. But many, many Christians find themselves professing to belong to the body of Christ, but they are lonely. They say that I can learn online. And I can be discipled online. That's true. You can go online and hear many good preachers better than me. You can hear doctors and professors just give amazing, amazing sermons. You can be disciplined, or excuse me, discipled online. You can go on to certain websites, you can go to certain ministries, and you can get all these great resources in this material. You can read your own Bibles, and you can do your own study, and as you should. But sadly, many Christians have fallen into this trap. You know what they think? They don't need the church. You hear people say terms like, I am the church. And as a pastor, I have seen many people go down this road where they get locked in to an internet preacher or to an internet community, and they feel that that is their only community, and that is the right community, and they separate themselves from abiding with a community of like-minded believers. They make minors into majors. They focus on the things that are external, not inward. They become unteachable, boastful, haughty. These believers lack many things, such as maturity, but one of the biggest things that they are missing is communion with the saints. And when you're not having communion with the saints, that means there's an issue with your communion with God. Because when God redeemed us, changed us, and saved us, when we have been reconciled to a holy father, we're not just reconciled to him through Jesus Christ, we're also reconciled to his creation, which is one another. And so how we treat one another, how we speak to one another, our desire to be around one another is exactly an, uh, an evidence of what's going on inside the heart towards God. Now, we have been called to worship corporately. We've been called to be together. We've been called to celebrate our salvation in Jesus Christ alone. And in this, we come together through corporate prayer, corporate singing, sitting under the Word of God, communion, baptism, and so forth. We spend time with Him. And in spending time with Him, we spend time together. But the together is secondary. The most paramount issue is that we spend time with God. And so when you look at the text that we are in, in verse 12 it says, No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. And by this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. So we as Christians are called to abide with God. This is a very important aspect as we look at this. This is basically the third message on what it means to walk in love. And all of a sudden we look at that word that's found in verse 12 and in verse 13, abide, and it means to have personal communion. A personal communion with God. And so we know that we have per personal communion with God, that we are in Him when we actually display and live a life that is proper according to Christian conduct. 
Now, this is a very powerful statement, specifically verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. This is strong theological language. It's it's huge. And what's taking place here is that there's this confession going on with us and that we belong to God. If you think about it for a moment, what we're talking about is Trinitarian language once again. The Father, who is the one who initiates, the Son who mediates, and the Spirit, who is the unifier, as it were, the the indwelling of the Spirit, we start to understand something very, very important. That Back to verse 12, that if we love one another, God abides in us. And is perfected in us, carried to 13, as I said, and by this we know that we abide in him and he in us, that he has given us his spirit. So abiding represents a closeness with God. Not a distance. Our relationship with God is not Facebook. It's not Twitter. It's not Instagram. It is a close communion with our God. And when you look at what verse 13 is saying, it is the Spirit, which we call the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, but this is why we use the term the Spirit of the living God. What we learn here very carefully is that the Spirit of the living God is with us. He has given us His Spirit. It's not enough that God has saved us. It's not enough that God took us, a bunch of former alcoholics or fornicators or idolaters or thieves. It's not enough that he saves us, but he gives us his spirit. And because he gives us his spirit, we can abide. We cannot abide without his spirit. So we cannot walk without being close to God. And this is where the assurance of our salvation comes from. This is why we have confidence in God that we are going to make it. And again, it's not because of who we are, but it's because of who he is. We don't put our confidence in self, but we put our confidence in God. So that would mean we're very unique people. We're very peculiar people. This is why the world cannot understand us. This is why the world has a problem with our message. This is why they're trying to deem it radicalization. Because they cannot get this concept of what it means to be fully in God and to love God and to abide with God and that he is not just simply with us, but God is in us. That's why we can make statements about people who profess Christ, that believers or professing believers cannot walk in any way that makes them feel comfortable with their sin. So if you are in this room and you are sinning constantly and you are comfortable in that sin, there is a huge problem with the profession of faith. The believer knows what sin is because the spirit becomes grieved. When we look, when we shouldn't look, when we touch and taste what we shouldn't touch and taste, we get convicted of our sin. And so when we're finding ourselves sinning freely, we have to ask, are we abiding? Are we truly abiding? Do we have this closeness, this communion with the living God? Because abiding confirms character. We are who we are in Christ only because of who he is. Our Christian growth, our conviction, our endurance, it's all because he has given it to us. So, since he has given us his spirit, we need to think about this for a moment. What does it mean to be a Christian who walks in the spirit? What does it mean to be spirit-filled? What does it mean to have the gifting of the spirit? Because many people have mishandled this verse. The first thing I would like to do is go back to John 1. That's the gospel of John. 
and look at verse 12. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So as many as received to him, he gave them the right to become children of God. He gave them. Remember that. And so the proof of our abiding in Christ is that we are born again believers who walk close and have communion with our God and therefore we are people who actually walk in the spirit, not the flesh. Again, this is what the world cannot understand. And this needs to be unpacked big time. Now, unfortunately, some people have taken this to the absolute extreme. You have people to say that if they are abiding with God and they are walking in the Spirit or they are filled in the Spirit or as verse 12, uh, as verse 12 says in our reading, or excuse me, verse 13, and he has given us his Spirit, many charismatic charlatans have run wild with this. You see, many of them make false professions. You have some people like Henry Hildebrandt, declaiming that he is Jesus Christ. You have the Church of God of Restoration making many many statements that are heretical outside of Orthodox Christianity. And they act in a way that brings reproach against the name of Jesus Christ. So is that an evidence of what walking in the Spirit is? Well, no. And some people say the evidence that we have been given the Spirit is because I can do all kinds of ministries. They claim that they can heal people. And if you didn't get healed, you didn't have enough faith. They claim prophecy. They claim speaking in tongues. And what's really great, they also profess that they can interpret their tongue. Is that what it means when God gives us his spirit? You have splinter groups of Christianity running amok with what true Christianity is all about. And they teach great error. You have individuals who will say that they have been baptized by the Spirit. And when they say that, it's not the same as you and I would speak about. So we have to refute that, don't we? We need the Word of God to teach us what does it properly mean. And in verse 13, by this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. There's something very clear of what it means here. And that means being people who have the Spirit of God are able to operate functionally in this world of great darkness. How is it that you can continue to preach and teach the gospel when you have everyone telling you that you're not allowed? When you have the churches and the governments telling you that you're only allowed to use certain language? How do you do that? How do you do it when you have police services watching your websites and attending your services? When they're trying to find ways to entrap you? How do you stand bold in the gospel the same way the the, the disciples did back in the day? When they were going before the Sanhedrin, that the Spirit gave them the ability to stand. And so the charismatics, we need to teach them that there's no second gifting here. Because for many people feel that you're either a supercharged, spirit-filled Christian, which means you're an elevated believer, or you're just simply one of those regular boring Christians who've just been baptized by water. And none of that is true. Sadly, many people in the PAOC, that is the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, teach that unless you speak in a tongue you are not showing evidence of salvation. And they will use verses such as this to say to you, how can you be spirit-filled? Well, because if you look at your scripture, in verse 13, if you are his, he has given us his spirit, you should speak in tongues. Adding to the order of salutis and the evidence, the charlatans and all these things claim this. But we cannot forget abiding. We cannot forget the word abiding. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12. 
verses 12 and 13. Because we learn for those who have the Spirit and those who abide, it says, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members are the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we, um, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. That's what it means to be Spirit-filled. That's what it means that God's spirit is with us. That's what it means when it says God gave us his spirit. The evidence of an individual having the spirit of God means that we walk according to holy scripture. Let's just go back to chapter 3 of 1 John and look at verse 24. You shouldn't even have to change your page depending on your Bible. It says, and the one who keeps his commandments abides in him. And he in him. And we know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So the very testimony that one individual has the spirit, is a soundly saved, converted Christian, and the Holy Spirit indwells them, they are individuals who are able to follow the very word of God, his instructions and his teaching. They are able to walk and follow the commandments of Christ, even in a dark, hostile environment. No matter who is coming down upon them, they will continue to serve and follow Jesus Christ, even if it costs them their lives. And then Acts 1.8, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Let's just keep flipping for this morning. It's a good exercise for our fingers, and it keeps you all awake while I'm preaching. Let's go back to verse 7 for context. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And so we know the early apostles, they walked in spirit gifts. They were given the ability to perform signs and wonders to confirm the gospel message that was going out into the highways and to the byways. But the power also meant that they were able to preach with authority. They were able to preach accurately, even when they were declaring that there is no other king except for Jesus and complete defiance of Rome, defiance of Diocletian, Nero, and others. So power to preach. And if you go to a little bit further in Acts to chapter 14, Acts 14, verse 3, it says, Therefore they spent a long time there speaking boldly with the reliance upon the Lord who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. So many people pass over the fact that they were preaching boldly. So we know we're abiding with him, that we have communion with him. We know that his spirit is upon us because he's given it to us when we are giving bold proclamation about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we can look at those who are opposing the very message and when they tell you you have to live one way, you say, no, I'm going to live according to this way. Why are you going to live this way? And you proclaim to them the goodness of the gospel, to what has saved us, to the wonderful gift that we have been given and how can we ever go back from that point. Another evidence of walking in the Spirit or having this Spirit with us, turn to Galatians 5, 22. Galatians 5, 22. The fruit of the Spirit. Singular, not plural, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. The very first point is love. We are now on the third message of the Apostle John talking about we are going to be known as people who love one another because God first loved us. And one of the very first evidence of the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. That's a beautiful list. What else do we have? Let's go back to our Bibles in Romans 8. Romans 8, 
verse 26. That's why we got you to stand up and sit down a couple times. It felt like mass because we knew you were going to do a lot of flipping today. It says in Romans 8, 26, In the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So we know another evidence is we go before the Father in prayer. We don't go to him as spoiled, rotten little children. There's sometimes we came and pray, and you just, you're there, and you're just, there's nothing that could come out, but you're just bearing it all. How do we pray that way? The Spirit's with us. Lastly, back to the Gospel of John 15. I could have went in order, but I want us to get used to our Bibles and get you flipping around. It's, it's good. It's a good exercise. Unless you have a really cheap made Bible, you're going to be full of paper cuts. In John 15, 26, but when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. Beautiful Trinitarian language there. But we know then that we abide with God. We know then that we are His. We know that we have the Spirit because He teaches us what we should believe, what is true, and what is false. And we live in a world of falseness, don't we? We live in a world right now where everything is being challenged. And dear Christian, mark your calendars, because I've said it many times, You are living in a Canada now that is not kind to Christians. You live in a post-Christian nation. You live in a nation that despises Christians. You have rulers who are passing laws that will imprison you to have your faith if you do not line up to the narrative of what they are teaching. Now don't get me wrong, you can be religious in Canada. You just can't be Christian. And so when the the, the challenge comes at you to believe something. It's the Holy Spirit that will help you know truth. Let's go to verse 14. I only got about another four hours here. And we have beheld and bear witness that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Again, more beautiful language. The evidence that His Spirit is with us The evidence that it's not about charismatic gifting. It's not about having some kind of adulterated, polluted stank of some kind of improper scripture interpretation. But what we know and the reason why we can stand and the reason why the Spirit is with us is because we serve a risen Christ. He is a risen Christ, and we have beheld and bear witness that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He can't be Savior if he's still buried in the ground. He has risen indeed. And then John is talking about his testimony and how we as a church can give testimony of all that Christ did and what is available. This is what we proclaim. This is what we tell the world, and this is why the world hates our message, because it is absolute. It is absolute. There is not one other person in human history that was both truly God and truly man, truly divine and truly flesh. There's no other person in history that was executed, buried, and rose on the third day. This is why the world hates you. This is why on TV you will hear them mock Jesus Christ. They will blaspheme Jesus Christ. You can blaspheme in a school. You can wear a t-shirt with a feminized Jesus on a cross that is most grotesque and you will still be allowed in class. But if you bow your head for that cheese sandwich and your fruit drink and they hear you, you will be suspended because they don't want the world to hear this message. They don't want it. But we are people to speak truth. And that's what John is doing. The attack of his apostolic ministry is at play here. Remember what we've been going through, what I've been preaching on, what Pastor Tony's been preaching on. 
Though the term Gnostic wasn't known yet then, the early form of Gnosticism was rising up in the church. There was Judaism coming into, uh, Judaizers trying to attack the church. And so John is coming back to that original thought of what has been seen and what has heard. He's coming back to the incarnate, to the Son of God. And he's giving the evidence that if you are spirit-filled, you won't be teaching like these people. Basically, if you have been, if the Spirit is in you, you know God, and you're not going to contradict His Word. This is the argument that John is making. And then he moves on a little bit further in verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. It's a simple statement, but it's a loaded statement. And those early Gnostics were not confessing that Jesus Christ was truly man and truly God. So it kind of brings about this doctrinal test of the apostle. It's kind of like the conclusion. Whoever confesses, whoever speaks from their mouth, whoever can teach these things are not false teachers. But those who speak against these things, they're the ones causing divisions and disruptions. They're the ones that cause us to go sideways. And you know what was going on in the early church? People were leaving. So if we're sitting here today thinking that we cannot walk away from a church or because we're a church member that we're not going to be going sideways because of false teachers, we need to remember that people were leaving the church. These Gnostics, these enlightened people were convincing them with their arguments. Even though they were denying repentance from sin, even though they were denying salvation in Christ alone, people were being taken captive by what was being spoken. This is why we've covered most of it. We'll cover more later. False teachers. False teachers. 2 Peter 2.1. You don't have to go that far back. If you go to 1 Peter, you've gone too far. 2 Peter 2.1. But false prophets also rose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Who here has got in trouble when you were a kid for not telling the whole truth to your parents? And then they're like, yeah, why'd you lie to me? I didn't lie. And then whack. Well, you didn't tell me the truth either, did you? You held back. False teachers don't necessarily have to be the big name charlatans. They can be the ones who sit back silently. And in their silence, it is deafening. Because they give approval to all the falsehoods that are going on. And by being silent and not being vocal, not being active, they are giving way to false teachers. One of the biggest things that happened in Canada, and I'm just going to say it, is because so many pastors cowered, and so many pastors decided to nurse off the government, and so many shut their churches down, and so many gave a public display that Jesus is nothing more than some kind of sissy that doesn't deserve to be worshipped. The government has looked upon those failures and said that's the way a Christian should act. And when the government applauds your pastor and applauds your church, run like you're leaving hell. See, if I said it the other way, you're like, well, he swore. But if I said it that way, it's proper. Go to Acts 20. I'm going slow today, you notice that? Because what I have to say is important. I don't want to lose it. In Acts 20, 30, it says, And from among you, your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Is that not what's happening? So we need to consider these things. We need to consider that what John is doing, he's writing to an ancient church, but that church is also us. The canon is complete. It is perfected. We know that when Paul, uh, excuse me, in the book of Revelation, when John wrote to the seven churches, seven means completion. Therefore, all the instruction of Holy Scripture is for all the Christian church today. We get this. And so what John is doing then, he is saying, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, it could cost them their life. And we're getting there. It could cost us our life. 
How, Pastor Steve? We got time. Just let's just, let's do with this. I, wa- I want us to wake up this morning. It's persecution happening in Canada. Thank you. Can you look back in Canadian history? Even if you start from the 40s, other than Quebec, when a couple of fellowship pastors were actually bold enough to proclaim the Bible in a certain school that got a little bit roughed up and arrested, can you name how many times pastors have been arrested in Canada as the extent they have been now? Pastor James Coates, Grace Life Church, church lockdown during COVID, over, over COVID. Tim Stevens, arrested. I don't agree with his ministry. I don't agree with his philosophy. I do not endorse him in any which way, one way or the other. But in Canada, you do have a right of freedom of religion. Art Pulowski, arrested. Pastor Jacob Ram's church, locked down. Pastor Aaron Rock's church, locked down. The Mill Christian Fellowship, harassed by public health officers. A pastor by the name of... Um, Stephen Richardson, removed from his pastorate in the Presbyterian church because he was ratted on by somebody within his very church. Can you tell me a time when it's costing you to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ? Dear church, listen to me. It's not going to get any better anytime soon. The Word of God tells us very clearly that we are God's. He is with us and the Spirit is with us and we walk in boldness. If your faith does not have you now willing to lay it down and count the cost, you're going to find yourself giving up your faith very quickly. Look at Romania. Richard Wormbrand. The movie is perfect because his wife goes, are you going to say something? He says, I can't say something. She goes, I would rather have a husband in prison than a coward. He was beaten in prison. Man, half of you can't even pray over your dinner with your wives. You don't even know half your Bibles. You don't even read them. You don't research them. How are you going to stand in the days of the Antichrist? How are we going to speak and proclaim this message? Verse 15 is clear. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and we in God. But we have more men who go out with the boys and the minute they start blaspheming Jesus, they quietly sip their drink and say nothing because they're more afraid of their friends disowning them than the King of glory saying, depart from me, I never knew you. Are we going to wake up, church? Wives, your husbands may be in jail soon. If there are any men worth their weight, they will be in jail soon. Are we out in the street corners preaching? Are we warning people to flee from the wrath to come? Are we telling them to flee from the wrath of the, from the almighty God because their allegiance to false teachers? Because what it means when we walk with boldness and power and being filled with the Spirit, you boil it down to this, we're giving public declaration of the glory of God in the face of all of our enemies. Give, we give allegiance to Christ. Confessing, a public declaration. It's used in the errorist sense. It's pointing to one thing. Public profession of one person. The king. Stop using terms to help. Stop saying Jesus is my Lord and Savior. If that helps you, that's fine. Please. But say this now on. Jesus is my king. I am his servant. My king reigns. I am a subject. I will not bow my knee to anyone except for Christ. I will not bow to a tyrannical government. I will not bow to a public school system. I will not bow down to the LGBTQ mafia that is threatening to destroy my life and my family. I will bow to King Jesus. And when they take you to prison, to the courts, you look at the judge. And you simply say, judge, you do what you must do. You're no different than the judge from Pilgrim's Progress. You are corrupt. And I will not bow to you either. So lock me up, put the keys away, and get on preaching the gospel in prison. Seriously. It's coming. Verse 16. We have come to know 
and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Again, it's more this language of our faith going back and forth, back and forth, that we have faith in Christ Jesus. Dear Christian, you know God's love is real. You know it's real. I know it's real. How can God take a man who walks down the streets of Toronto and throwing people through bus shelters and waking up drunk and being high as a kite and full of anger and knuckles bleeding constantly, how can he love me? But he did, and I can testify that he is loved, and I love him. Do you love him? Because if you love him and you testify of this love and you abide in this love, nothing is going to stop you from doing what he's asked you to do in this day and in this hour. And all aspects of your Christian character is going to be pointed right back to Jesus Christ. Everything. The way you raise your families. Because we have the indwelling of the Spirit. Verse 17 and 18 goes on. By this, love is perfected with us that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because he, uh, excuse me, as he is, so also are we in this world. 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Now this is not about fear of the world. The scripture is very clear. We already know that we're going to be secure on the day of judgment. We already know that our salvation is secure. We knew that. We know this. We live it. The believer does not have to walk on eggshells about the fear of judgment or being cast into hell. And that's what verse 18 is clearly expressing, that we do not need to have fear because we have the very love of God with us. We are perfected in love. So what are we worried about in this world? We should have a confidence. The only way I know how to describe this is when I was still in uniform. And it's a really cheesy analogy, but it's an analogy nonetheless. Pastors are supposed to have analogies to teach you that. So if I'm standing here right now, I feel pretty exposed. But when I used to put on my patrol boots, I would put on my belt. You had your baton and your pepper spray, your cuffs and all the fun toys they give you and your vest, that uniform, you felt more protected. You had a bit more confidence. I wouldn't walk up to a car and do a roadside stop dressed like this. But you felt a little bit more protected when you had that stuff on. And you also felt more protected and more bold because of what you represent. I'm not pulling somebody over because Steve thinks you're speeding. I represented the province of Alberta. And the patch on my shoulder gave me that authority to do that. So what we're learning here about this perfect love casting out fear is that we have a uniform on that's better than any military or paramilitary uniform. We are clothed in the full armor of God. We are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. We have his spirit in us, and therefore, we do not need to fear anything, not even judgment. So let's get out there, do what we're called to do, and let God worry about the rest. And then when the day of judgment does come, believe me, I hope it's today, and I hope it's a whole bunch of meteors coming to this earth, because I'm going to be up on my roof preaching with my smartphone like the rest of you taking pictures. Anyway, side note, make sure you're awake. But we don't have to worry about judgment. We don't have to worry about those things. Verse 20. Actually, let's go verse 19. We love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. He took our shame. He took our guilt. He took our disobedience. He took our denials. He took our perverted thoughts. And he bore them on the cross of Calvary. And our most serious spiritual wound was healed. Death becomes life.
We love because he first loved us. The highest, greatest standard of love. The one who holds all supremacy. The king of glory. The ancient of days. Loves us. He loves you. And he didn't call us to congregate in this room to proclaim the glory of his name only. We are to proclaim the worth and his glory to the nations. We are to exalt his name above every name. That he is the king of kings and the lord of lords in the midst of the Gentiles and the pagans. To the prostitutes and the destitutes. And when we, even when we fail to do that, the birds and the oceans declare his glory. The winds of Pluto declare his glory. We love because he loved us. And if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has sent cannot love God whom he has sent. And this commandment we have heard from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Love. Go to Matthew 5. Let's wrap this up. Matthew 5. We'll start at verse 21. Because in this dark hour, friends, a lot of us in our Christian zeal, sometimes we get angry. And sometimes we leave churches and sometimes we see friends and Christians who are not living the way they should. And we get angry with them and we say, listen, that's a bad sin. You can't be angry. They're like, well, it's not like I killed the guy. Matthew 5, 21, you have heard that the ancients told you that you shall not commit murder, and whoever com uh, commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Anger and murder, in God's eyes, are very, very close. Last one, let's go over to verse 43 to 48. 43 to 48 of Matthew 5. Jesus says, you have heard. So basically, equivalent of it is written. But you have heard. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the, his son to rise on the evil and the good. And sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what, excuse me, what do you do more than the others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Failure, me, big time. So let's take this home. How do you know if you're walking right with Christ in your life? There's been a lot of heavy, heavy words thrown down today, but here's the bottom line. If you are trusting that God gave you his spirit and that you can walk in the conviction of your faith, you know you're doing okay. You might not be out there on the highways and the byways proclaiming the gospel. You might not be doing all that yet, but if you have a desire and a conviction to live the Christian life, that is good. If you are one who confesses the reality of what's going on in your life and you can give testimony to what Jesus Christ has done for you, if you are an individual who walks with, in communion with God, if you are striving to love your brother and sister more and more every day, then you're doing okay. Don't leave here thinking that you're going to be finished. We've covered that. But we all have work to do. We all have to love. We have to love each other more. We have to love the world more because this shows the evidence of change within us. There's no one in this room who's able to love God or one another according to the standard of Holy Scripture. Only one person could do that. Jesus Christ. But we don't have to be satisfied where we are today. We can ask him for the strength, for the sanctification, and for the love and the grace to grow in Christ.
But may I implore you one last time, stop bowing to this world. Stop giving this world your allegiance. It belongs to Christ alone. 